So, well, well anyway, welcome to um, these uh, lunchtime talks from Butterfly Conservation Europe. Um, we're going to have a miscellaneous section, a selection of talks from different people over, I don't know how long we'll keep it going, as long as it's popular, I guess. Um, so I'm going to start off uh, this talk about how butterflies survive the winter. And um, I suspect this is one of the things that people assume lots is known about where butterflies go the winter, but actually I think it's one of the least well-known parts of the butterfly life cycle. So um, I'm, what, I, what I'm going to put in this talk is, 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 is partly what I know, but I don't think there's much else is known unless people come to me afterwards. So um, part of this, I would like to hear if anyone's got any more information about um, where butterflies survive the winter and uh, um, any tactics that they use. So I'm going to uh, give you a quick run through. Um, I'm going to talk mainly about species that occur in my country, the UK, but um, i give you a bit of an overview, first of all, about uh, Europe and the situation. Um, so if you look at um, the, uh, let's get clicked up, um, the, the percentage of European species, which, and, and their overwintering stage, you realize that actually a very small percentage, 4%, actually overwinter as adults. So we kind of, when you think of overwintering butterflies, you think of the adults, but actually most overwintering in different stages. So you can see that the most popular is for a larvae stage. So two thirds of the European species overwinter as larvae, 20% as pupae, 10% as egg. Um, and of course, there are a few species right down in the Mediterranean area, um, which uh, don't have an overwintering stage because they breed right through the year in warm countries, in warm situations. So there's about, um, I think about 14 species like that, um, but the rest actually go into some sort of hibernation stage um, over the winter. So that's how they do it. And I'm going to concentrate on the adult stage, but just dip into um, some of the eggs and larvae stages as well. Oh, for some reason, my screen's not moving. <laughs> that's not very good. Oh, sorry. Uh, now it moves. <laughs> OK, so um, hibernating adults. So here's a selection of European species that hibernate as an adult. Um, I've got the scientific names up there, um, but I'll probably refer to them as English names. So we've got large tortoiseshell on the left, Camberwell Beauty and Comma, and the um, uh, nettle tree butterfly and, oh, sorry, sorry, uh, nettle tree butterfly and the red admiral. So these are all in the um, Nymphalidae, the Vanessid uh, family. So that they seem to have specialized in overwintering as adults. And you can see one of the things that's very noticeable about them is that they have leaf shaped wings. So if you see a butterfly with uh, leaf shaped wings, um, you're probably sure that it's going to overwinter as an adult. And then the other ones that overwinter as adults are the um, brimstone butterflies, the Ganetris species. So there's about four species in Europe and they all overwinter as adults as well. And again, you can see they have these beautiful leaf shaped sculptured wings. So all these species are probably somewhere out there at the moment, hibernating somewhere in a place near you. And where they go is, is I think still a bit of a mystery actually, because I know few people that can regularly find hibernating butterflies. So where might they go in, in the natural situation? Well, of course, in woodland, they might go into trees and so on. And, and this is a site that I'm involved with where we very occasionally find overwintering butterflies in these log piles. So they clearly, the log pile has been there for a while. Butterflies can snuggle down in there, but mostly we don't find them at all. So I'm guessing, and this is just guesswork. So this is where if anyone's got any better information, then please let me have it. In, in, the in the world natural situation, um, a, an old tree like this would provide some places for uh, perhaps gonectric species to overwinter in the ivy or in the holes in the trees, maybe some species go into those. So I'm guessing that's the sort of place they go into, obviously into caves as well, but of course caves are not so common in the landscape, so they must be using something else. So I'm guessing this is where they go. 
But most of our knowledge and my knowledge about hibernating butterflies come from man-made structures. And um, these can be various sort of outhouses, sheds, caves, but also these, um, these are Second World War bunkers. So near where I, I'm on the south coast of um, England, and um, there are quite a number of these uh, bunkers that were built um, in the Second World War. And they were sort of observation places and they're very thick concrete walls. And what they do have is they have um, slits at the bottom, which I think were observation slits or even gun uh, placements. Um, and so the butterflies can come in through those gaps in the, um, <coughs> in the bunker. Now, in this particular bunker that I've been monitoring for a few years, we get quite a lot of these peacock butterflies hibernate in there. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> and they tend to hibernate not on, the, on, not on the roof of the bunker, but actually down here on this little ledge, which is sort of sheltered quite close to the ground. So here's a little group of them there. And they, they often congregate together, so they're not scattered around the bunker. They're, they're, they're sort of huddled together, sometimes huddled very closely like here, um, but sometimes sort of just in a loose group. And they stay there through the winter, upside down, um, hoping, uh, waiting for spring to come. And of course, they have to um, suffer some quite cold weather. And this picture here was taken when we had quite a cold frost. Didn't freeze inside the bunker quite, but they had condensation over them um, it, when I went to visit, visit. So they can survive there, but they obviously don't freeze. So that's, I guess, for them, um, advantageous. But of course, any, any of these uh, caves or bunkers or whatever, sheds, have predators lying in wait. So in my uh, bunker that I've been monitoring, there's quite a lot of these big spiders there. Uh, and also once uh, recently I found this uh, smooth snake uh, lurking in the bottom of the, um, uh, of the bunker. And of course you do occasionally find uh, some remains of butterflies, particularly uh, um, later in the winter where they've clearly been eaten. But in the bunkers that I monitor, there's very little uh, mortality through the winter. So, uh, but I'm guessing that's unusual. Uh, and I'm guessing it's because actually birds seem to be the main predators of overwintering butterflies. And they probably, they just for some reason don't go into these bunkers, maybe because those slits are just rather too small for them. But anyway, spiders, these spiders don't seem to eat these butterflies over winter. And as far as I know, this snake doesn't either. And of course, the, if they are attacked by um, birds, species like the peacock have this defensive reaction where they flash their eye spots um, to, to deter predators. And um, research by Adrian Vallin some years ago, he tested whether this did deter um, butterflies like um, uh, robins and uh, uh, blue tits. And it does in fact deter butterflies, they most, uh, birds, they mostly fly off once this defensive flicking and those eye spots are revealed. So that's clearly uh, a good defensive um, mechanism for them. And um, I, I'm not, I can't go into all this because we don't have time in this short talk, but um, I do refer you to this website here. This is a, a colleague of mine who lives uh, near London. And he's been monitoring for some while. He has this sort of outhouse attached to his house here, which has these grills. And there's no other windows in this building, in this sort of shed, really, attached to the house. And um, he's been monitoring um, small tortoiseshells going into there for some years. And he's finding that they are actually entering hibernation very early, like in the end of July, even beginning of August. Um, which is very early, and they seem to be doing this in southern England rather than having a second generation. So normally they used to have two generations, but they seem to be more and more having just one generation and going into hibernation really, really early. So um, that's a, an ongoing study um, which is showing that how butterflies are changing, whether it's climate change or whether it's parasite avoidance, we're, we're really not sure. Um, so anyway, he, he speculates in that um, um, study there that I mentioned. 
and uh, other species that overwinter. Now, this is a, a remarkable photo that I've just seen uh, through a colleague of mine down in the in southwest England, John Walters uh, and um, Amanda Hunter found these overwintering comma butterflies, Polygonia sea album. And uh, I don't know if you can see in this picture, this is a natural picture where they found them overwintering. And there's actually three of them in this little cluster of uh, leaves and twigs. And uh, if you haven't already spotted them, there they are. And you can see they're incredibly well camouflaged. And apparently they've been using the same <laughs> branch and uh, uh, for several years now. So it seems to be particularly good for some reason for this species. So whether it's because, as you can see, it's a, it's a sort of branch that has lots of little twigs growing out of it, which capture the leaves, which stay there over the winter. And maybe that's what they're going for, is something where there are these dead leaves over the winter, but obviously not on the ground, um, where they can, their mimicry is really, really incredibly good. So that's a remarkable picture, I think, um, and one of the few pictures of what I would say a butterfly genuinely in a natural habitat in the wild overwintering. And um, many people in the past have speculated about this tiny little mark on the underside of this butterfly. Um, and uh, some remarkable work by Olison and colleagues um, looked at bird predation and they found that this little tiny little mark actually reduces bird predation. Now it's almost impossible for us to kind of imagine that that's the case. Uh, it doesn't reduce it by a huge amount but it does reduce it and of course in evolutionary terms any advantage is good. So um, this tiny little mark on the underside of, of this butterfly actually has a survival adaptation, a survival uh, strategy. So um, that's a remarkable piece of work and something that I think most people wouldn't expect uh, actually works to deter bird predation. Why it works uh, is anybody's guess really, but it must be something to do with the way that they blend into the surroundings to, to disrupt their shape. And of course the whole uh, wing shape here is of a leaf and it doesn't look like a butterfly and obviously that's deliberate so that birds don't home in on them. And uh, the only other uh, overwintering butterfly that I've seen in the wild is, uh, is the brimstone. And this one was overwintering actually in, a, in my garden um, underneath a garden plant. But um, elsewhere, pre-digital age, I've seen them uh, overwintering in ivy, which is obviously evergreen through the winter. So that's something I guess that they do probably throughout Europe. But again, if anyone's got any photos or knows places where they do ever went, I would be interested. So let's move on to eggs. Um, so a lot of butterflies overwinter as eggs, well, about 10% of them, so more than overwinter as adults. Uh, and here's an example, uh, the brown hair streak, um, which lays its eggs on young prunus growth. And here's a couple of eggs to lay together. They're normally laid singly. And they lay on the new growth um, and this growth is actually what we call like a sucker growth so this is so they um, spread by underground suckers this plant and the brown hair streaks seem to like laying on the young suckers or the young growth on hedges and uh, edges of scrub um, and they overwinter like that and you can see the eggs have this amazing um, structure which uh, obviously gives them some strength. And you can see here, this is the tiny micropile where they, which allows oxygen to come into them through the winter and allow the caterpillar to develop in the spring. So these um, uh, brown hair streaks sit there through the winter and actually they're, once you get your eye in, they're actually extremely um, easy to spot uh, because they always lay on the new growth, not the growth that's covered in lichens or anything. Um, and, we do a lot of monitoring of these eggs. We do timed counts. Uh, we have volunteers going out um, and quite a number of sites around the UK are monitored in this way. And that adds a lot of information, not only on where they're breeding, but also um, how populations do from year to year. And it's a butterfly that is very difficult to find as an adult. So monitoring eggs is the best way of uh, monitoring the populations. 
And another one that actually I have been doing a long, long running study of overwintering um, uh, silver spotted skipper here, Hesperia comma, which lay on um, little um, patches of Festuca ovina, often next to bare ground. And they have these very, um, very brilliant white dome shaped eggs you can see here. Um, and these are laid on the um, grass, uh, often on these small tufts of grass, and they sit there over the winter. But actually what seems to be very odd about these is that they, if, if, if they're touched at all, they ping off. So I'm guessing that most of them end up in the soil uh, and the young caterpillars have to then find their way onto the grass um, to overwinter. Another species that overwinters an egg is um, this one, uh, Tamalicus lineola, the Essex skipper, which lays its eggs in, um, in, the, in the sheaths of grasses, um, where you get a, a little group of eggs here like this um, laid in the sheath, and they stay there through the winter. And it's one of the reasons why um, we always urge people to leave some long grass uh, through the winter, because there are things hibernating in that long grass, and this is one species that there. So if, if this is a field margin, which is actually very good for this species, um, it's been planted with wildflowers and has long grass. But of course, if it was cut in the winter, all these eggs would be destroyed. So um, yeah, leave some long grass where you can. And here's another species that I've studied, um, the high brown fertility, again, it's adipe. And here's a female laying, and they lay their eggs in um, brown leaf litter. So in this case, it's bracken, bracken uh, but they'll also lay on dead oak leaves and other leaves. But it's quite important for them because they're one of the few nymphalids that overwinter as an egg. Uh, they lay, they choose leaf litter that doesn't rot down very quickly through the winter. So that's obviously pretty crucial because they, you don't want your egg to be in amongst a whole load of rotting vegetation. So they lay their eggs on this uh, often uh, dead leaf litter and the larvae will wander off in the spring to feed on violets. So there's another beautiful picture by Peter Eels of this fabulous um, structured eggs. I mean, the structure of butterfly eggs is, is another story and is, is a, a very beautiful, they're very beautiful um, shapes. So let's move on to larvae. So as I said, this was the, this is the most common way of butterflies overwintering. So here's um, the marsh artillery, um, widespread in, in Europe still. Uh, we get quite a few populations in Southern England. And here's one uh, where they, so they um, overwinter as small caterpillars. And most uh, species that overwinter as caterpillars tend to overwinter as relatively small caterpillars. And they spin a, a, um, a protective web. They live in this web um, in most of their lives, but in winter they spin a particularly tight um, web quite close to the ground, often a centimetre or two amongst the ground in amongst a grass tussock. And within this grass, in the, this nest, you're, there may be anything up to 200, 300 larvae all sitting there overwintering together. And you can see here's a couple which are still on the outside of the um, of this silken web. And uh, these will head inside to overwinter with the others. And you can see they're black and in the springtime they'll come out and sunbathe um, because they're black and they can sunbathe together and get quite warm in spring sunshine. So that's a survival tactic. But also many of you know that butterflies get parasitized and you can see in this photo a couple of these tiny little white cocoons, which is um, the cocoons of uh, a specific parasite called a Pantales bignellii. And that Apantales has several generations to the caterpillar, one caterpillar generation, and numbers of parasites build up. And the parasites have uh, two generations before the hibernating stage. And this, what these parasites will be hatching out and reinfecting these hibernating caterpillars before hibernation. Another example of an overwintering um, caterpillar. Um, this is um, the lulwa skip, and here it's uh, tucked up in this tube, silken tube of some grasses which have been spun together, and you can just make out the silk there, and it's actually in this case spun two grasses together, 
and they can overwinter as sort of um, half-grown larvae or young larvae, it seems. So we seem to have, in the UK at least, them going through as either young larvae or quite big larvae. And another species overwinters um, uh, as, a, as a, a larva. Again, it's quite a young larva, so this is only uh, less than a centimetres long. This is the wonderful purple emperor. And these amazing photos, some colleagues of mine, Ben Greenaway and uh, Matthew Oates, are actually monitoring these um, caterpillars over the winter to see how they get predated, how many get predated. It's a lot, a lot get predated over the winter. So, and they often sit just along uh, a twig of their food plant, the willow, which they lay their eggs on. They often lay on young plants, young trees, um, and they overwinter there just tucked in. And you can see they have these two um, horns, which um, may serve to disrupt the outline. And of course, because they're outside exposed in the winter, they can get covered in frost. And this fabulous photo uh, by Ben Greenaway shows this. Uh, you can just make out the little horns on it covered in frost, which I think is just one of the most remarkable pictures. Um, and obviously they can survive that. They can survive the frost um, and happily continue their life cycle in the spring. So let's move on lastly to those that go through as pupae. And here's an example. So here's uh, uh, the white abmore. And most of the butterflies that go through as, as, as pupae have these most beautifully sculptured um, and well camouflaged um, pupae. But I think the, the, the prize has to go to this um, white abmore for its just remarkable uh, shape that obviously serves to disrupt its outline. These are incredibly difficult to find in the wild, all these uh, pupae and indeed the caterpillars uh, are incredibly difficult to find, uh, which is why I think they're so um, less well known than other stages of the life cycle. So here's obviously a large white, which uh, probably is the one that's seen most because it's obviously feeds in people's gardens on cabbages and, and often pupates on walls or fence posts in gardens. And the lovely orange tip, you can see here one just about to emerge. Uh, you can imagine if that was in amongst a whole load of grasses, how well camouflaged that would be. And, and a few overwinter um, as pupae on the ground surface or just under the ground. And here's an example of the green hair streak of um, a pupa that goes through the winter on the ground. Uh, and obviously that that's, has to have a different tactic uh, to avoid being eaten but mostly they're extremely well camouflaged the pupae so that they can um, avoid being predated. And an example of why they need to avoid predation is given here by the swallowtail and that has two colour forms of the of the pupae. So some, quite a few actually do have two colour forms and, and if they pupate a, on a green stem against a green background the pupae will be green, and if they pupate in dead material, um, they'll, they'll be brown. So you can imagine that uh, something like swallowtail, which has several generations a year, the summer generations tend to be green and the winter generations tend to be brown. And I'm gonna finish by this, this, which I think is one of the most remarkable pictures I've seen of a, of a butterfly actually, because it actually shows um, the pupa of a uh, wood white. And this was found in the wild uh, and again, I say very few people have actually ever seen pupae of, of any species in the wild. Uh, but here is the pupa of this butterfly. It's just emerged. They no doubt saw the butterfly first, took some photos and then realized that the pupa was just down below. And again, you can see it's in long grass. Another reason not to cut some grass because species like this will be breeding. And there we are, spring is coming. Some of these butterflies will be hatching soon. Uh, in a locality near you and hopefully you'll be out there enjoying them. So thank you very, very much for listening uh, and thank you very much for the photographers who gave permission for me to use their photos for this talk uh, and the ones that aren't credited are mine. And if you're interested in reading more about life cycles of butterflies and how the, they develop these different strategies to um, survive, then I have written a book. It's mainly about UK species, but uh, of course they, these species occur right across Europe and might be interesting to you. So thanks very much. <laughs>